Oh, hello there. Welcome to Chapel. Uh, during this last few weeks, I've been uh, watching NPR's Tiny Desk Concerts. I don't know if you've seen them on YouTube, quite fun. Uh, inspired by that, I thought we might do a Tiny Desk uh, Chapel here this morning. Of course, we need a few things uh, for Chapel. We, uh, we need a hymn, uh, we need a Bible reading, we need a talk, uh, and uh, some music. Uh, so let's, uh, let's start with uh, the hymn. Uh, I don't have any music with me uh, currently, so let's see if we can uh, change that. Uh, Mr. Harding. Yes, Mr. Faraway, how are you? Great. Uh, look, we're uh, seeking to have a tiny desk chapel, and I'm wondering if you might be able to provide us uh, with some music. Oh, you could, that'd be fantastic. Uh, where are you right now? Oh, you're at the organ. That's convenient. Oh, you're sleeping at the organ nowadays. Okay, well, uh, each their own. Uh, I was wondering if you could play a tune for us for chapel. Uh, yep, uh, something that the boys all know. Behold the Lamb of God. Sounds perfect. That would fit with my talk. Uh, wonderful. Okay, so if you could just hold your phone near the speaker, uh, then maybe we'll be able to hear the music from here. Okay, let me just check. Uh, he's only willing to play if we sing along. Okay, I'll tell him that you're ready to go. Yep, absolutely. Everyone's uh, keen and raring to go. Awesome. Okay. Uh, excellent. You just start playing and uh, we'll hear what you have to uh, play. Cheers. Well, there we have it, our first hymn at our tiny desk chapel. 
Uh, I hope you sang along. If you didn't, uh, you missed an opportunity to feel that sense of connection uh, with everyone as we all uh, sang along together. Next time, maybe even just hum the tune. I realize singing at home alone, or perhaps home in the midst of others, might be a little challenging, but don't, don't miss the opportunity to feel that sense of connection with the school as we uh, sing our hymns together. Uh, thanks, Mr. Harding, that was fantastic. Thanks for your help. Well, that's our hymn. Now it must be time for our Bible reading. That day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Today we're going to have a look at a Bible passage which confronts us with questions about death. Now I realize Australians aren't very comfortable talking about death, even thinking about death for very long. We hide ourselves from death as a society and hide death from us. But it is one of the most fundamental things to think about. The statistics are fairly clear. There are 6.5 billion people on the planet and all of them are going to die. Now as confronting as that is, it is fundamental to our understanding of what life is about to think about death. And so today's passage from Mark chapter 4 helps us to wrestle with questions of life and death. Let me set the scene for you. We're in Mark chapter 4. Jesus and his disciples have been uh, on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And the crowds around Jesus have become so great that the disciples decide to put him in a boat and push him off from the shore so that people will still have the opportunity to hear him without him being crushed. It's come to the end of a long day of teaching and he and his disciples decide to stay in the boat and push off and head to the other side of the Sea of Galilee to spend the evening away from the crowds. So we read in Mark chapter 4 verse 35. That day when evening came he said to his disciples let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. So they head across uh, the Sea of Galilee, but it turns out it's not going to be a very smooth trip. We read in verse 37, a furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Well, the disciples are petrified at this stage. Now these just aren't any you know, landlubbers in a boat here. These are hardened fishermen that have been on the Sea of Galilee for most years of their life. They're afraid. That's how significant uh, this storm is. They're going to get swamped. The boat is going to be you know, overcome by water and they're going to sink uh, to the bottom. Well, where is Jesus at this time? Here they are, thinking it's a moment of life and death. We turn to verse 38 and we read, Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? It's the sort of question you might expect to be asking at that time, isn't it? Here we are in this moment of life and death. Doesn't anyone care? What about Jesus? Doesn't he care? Teacher, 
don't you care if we drown is their question? Basically, teacher, don't you care that we're dying? Now I'm not sure quite what it was that they expected a teacher was going to be able to do for them at this stage. We have you know, great influence, but not always great power in these sorts of situations. There isn't quite a lesson objective in this moment that will rescue them. What were they hoping he would do? Well, Jesus does two surprising things. He speaks twice. And each of the things that he says is a bit confronting. We read in verse 39. He got up, rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was in that boat, I would have found that fairly extraordinary. Here are these hardened fishermen, fearing for their lives in the midst of a storm out at sea. And their friend, their teacher, gets up and dares to speak to the storm, to the waves, and tells them to be quiet, to be still. Now, I think it's fair enough for them to have thought, what is going on here? Has Jesus gone a little crazy? Who is he to speak to the wind and the waves? Well, what happens next would have really been surprising. The second half of verse 39, we read, He got up, rebuked the wind and the waves, said to them, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. What an extraordinary result to something that Jesus just said by his mere words. It reminds me of very early in the Bible, in fact, the very first chapter of the Bible, where God is said to have spoken the world into being. Let there be, God said, and it was so. And here is Jesus saying to the storm, quiet, be still, and it was so. The wind died down and it was completely calm. This reveals something about who Jesus was. Jesus was no mere teacher. He was God in the flesh. That makes the disciples' question all the more poignant. Don't you care if we drown, God? Don't you care that we're dying? Well, it's the sort of question that we might ask God at a time like this, when the world is ravaged by disease. Does God care? And if God cares, how much does he care? Does he care just a little? Does he care a lot? Later on in Mark's Gospel, as you know, we've read about how Jesus said that he had come to give his life as a ransom for many. That his purpose in living was not just to hang out and enjoy this time with the disciples, to go fishing with them on the Sea of Galilee, but he had come to serve others, to lay down his life for them. But he does that not just as a teacher. He does that as the Son of God, God himself in the flesh, come to dwell in our midst, to understand what it is, to ask questions about life to wrestle with poverty, to wrestle with sickness, to wrestle with the hard work and sweat and tears of life. And so when we ask Jesus, how much do you care that we're dying? His answer to that question is to raise his arms, to say, this is how much I care. For Jesus would lay down his life on a cross so that people might not just experience death, but that might know forgiveness in life. A forgiveness that would mean life could extend beyond death because it would be a restoration to right relationship with God. See, the Bible teaches that death itself 
is a consequence of human separation from God. And so Jesus came to make that separation cease. We all long at this time for a time when we can get back together again, a reconciliation of our whole society. And that's what Jesus came to bring. He came to bring a reconciliation between us and God. A reconciliation that means more than just relationship, but that means eternity in that relationship, where humans once again get to dwell with God and his people forever. Jesus does care. God does care that we're dying. But more than care, he has the power to do something about it. And that's what Jesus came to do. That's why Christians all over the world and for millennia have celebrated Easter. Because they know it's the time when they rejoice. Rejoice that Jesus died, but he died for us. And that his resurrection was the sign that there is life beyond death. That he has the power over life and death. I said Jesus said two surprising things. Well, here's the second from verse 40. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Another extraordinary question from Jesus. Why are you so afraid in the face of death? Do you still have no faith? He's calling upon his disciples and those who would seek to follow him to be able to trust him in times even like this. It's an extraordinary claim, but it's backed up by this extraordinary act to say in the midst of the storms of life, whatever our perils may be, here is someone who is our rescuer, our deliverer, even as bad as those circumstances might become. Well, in verse 41, we read about the disciples' response. They say, they were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. It's exactly the sort of question that we should be asking at Easter time. Who is this person that has been celebrated by so many people for such a long time? Why is it that people have been so drawn to him? Who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? Because answering that question is actually to answer the questions of life and death. What is life for? Jesus taught. Life is for loving our neighbors and for loving God. That's what God has always desired for humanity from the beginning and into eternity. And death? Death is something that we live with, and yet it is not the end of life. Jesus here promises that he has the power over life and death to rescue us from our greatest enemy, which is our sin, our separation from God, and to give us the hope of eternal life. A hope that isn't just, well, we hope it might happen, but a hope that is sure and built upon the foundation of Jesus' own resurrection from the dead. And that's what people celebrate at Easter time. I do hope that this is a great time with your family. I realize it won't be with your friends, but it is an opportunity for all of us to reflect upon what it means to live in the valley of the shadow of death. Is it to be overcome by fear and trepidation? Is it to have our circumstances so control how we act and live that we're no longer in control of them ourselves? Or is there another alternative? Is there someone we can put our trust in in the midst of times like this? Someone who has power over life and death? Well, the Bible's answer to that question is yes, there is. The one to whom the wind and the waves obeyed. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I wish you all a happy Easter. Well, let's pray for our world, uh, for each other, and for ourselves uh, at this time. Let's pray.
Heavenly Father, the creator of all things and all people, we do pray for our world at this time in the midst of its hardship with the coronavirus and many other things that are going on for other people in our world at this time. Heavenly Father, you are a God of compassion and mercy and you ask us to bring our requests uh, to you. And so we do that now, Lord, asking for your compassion and mercy upon people, particularly upon uh, those who are suffering at this time, those whose lives have been uh, changed, and perhaps even those families who have lost loved ones as a result of this disease. Lord, we pray that your mercy would extend to people knowing that your love for us is boundless, that even in the midst of tragedy, you provide us with the hope of life, life beyond death secured for us in your Son, and shown to us at his resurrection. Lord, we pray that you would strengthen the hand of those medical professionals and those politicians who are making decisions at this time about how best to approach this disease. Lord, we pray for those who are on the front line who are giving medical care. We ask that in your mercy they might be protected from becoming infected themselves and be able to continue their work in saving lives and sparing the suffering of others. Lord, we pray for our school community during this time of our dislocation, we pray, Lord, that you'll help us to stay connected uh, with each other, uh, with our uh, mentors, with our housemasters, with our teachers, that we'd maintain a sense of community. And we pray particularly over the holiday time that that might not be a time of uh, separation, but that you'd help us to stay uh, connected uh, with each other. And Lord, we do pray there'll also be a time when we get to invest in our families, given we'll be spending so much time uh, with them. And Lord, we pray for ourselves. We thank you for the challenge from your word uh, this morning uh, to ask ourselves the question, who is Jesus? Who is this one who gave such big claims, who had the power to control the wind and the waves, and who asked people to put their faith in him because of what he was able to do, not just for us, but for our world. Lord, we thank you that you give us the hope of a new creation, a restoration, a reconciliation, we pray, Lord, that in the midst of that hope, you would help us not to be blinded by the questions of life and death, that we would uh, yeah, turn to you and know that you have answers for us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there we have it, our first tiny desk chapel. Thanks for joining us. I hope it was of some encouragement uh, to you. Feel free to uh, share it with other people and your families uh, if they want to join along and see what we do uh, here at school. Uh, and to give them some encouragement at uh, this Easter time. Uh, I'll see you again soon. My intention is uh, next week during Easter uh, to release a video each day as we walk through the final week of Jesus' life from Palm Sunday through that Easter week right up to uh, Easter Sunday. So if you want to join us uh, for a short reflection on each of those days as we walk through that last uh, Easter week, uh, feel free. It'd be great to have you uh, to join with us. Have a great, happy and holy holiday uh, and I'll see you on this screen next time soon. Goodbye.